Okay, so we'll resume and start this afternoon's session with the first of the three talk we will have this afternoon. So it is a pleasure to welcome Stephen Brenner from the Computational Genomic Research Group at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, if I could summarize the work of Stephen is, I would say, I mean, a structural biologist by training. Stephen, you should already come in. I mean, and, but his interests are quite wide. I mean, goes to genome analysis, of course, structural genomics. He has worked a lot also on nonsense mediated decay, and we have used a lot of his work in Swiss plot. Uh, he's, of course, been involved in the SCOP database and also the SCORE database, which unfortunately I have to leave, I didn't know because we don't work on the RNA, and so on. So, as geographically linked to him, I put Boston, but of course, Cambridge, UK, where he worked, Stanford, and Berkeley. And as BioLinks had a big choice of people on which he, with whom he worked in UK when he was, I mean, uh, involved in all aspects of structural, I mean, bioinformatics, Joe Sotia, Tim Hubbard, Alexei Mosin, and Senna for two people with whom we seem to be publishing a lot, Gavin Brooks and Richard Gray. And, uh, I mean, I don't think I will give an anecdote of Sylvie because himself has an anecdote to say, I think, on, uh, as you will see, he will speak about his badge. Which is a bit special. So, and Amos, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And Amos and the whole Swiss Proc Group, a very happy 20th anniversary. I had an honor to be at the 10th anniversary meeting of Swiss Proc, and that's the badge I'm actually wearing here today. That happened at a very important time in my career as I was just finishing my graduate work. And actually, it was at that meeting that I learned from David Eisenberg that Amos is a prophet and that Yoel is a prophet. Um, and it was at that meeting that we first began to really analyze genome sequences. Um, and so it's been a terrific honor to be here as part of the birthday entertainment for the 20th anniversary um, and to be able to tell you about some work that's actually happened over the decades since that meeting. Although I do have one warning note, which is that not everything gets better over time. When I was going through my folders from that meeting, I found I had a bunch of currency, Israeli currency, that I actually changed when I went there which I went, and last year went to try to spend when I went back to Israel, and it turns out this is totally worthless now, because they've changed the currency since then. So hopefully they won't change the currency of sequences, and we can keep doing the analyses that we've been doing. So as I said, the work I'm going to be telling you about brackets the entire time from that meeting 10 years ago till today, and I'll start with some initial observations that I was making right around then, and then tell you about some very, very recent work at the end of the talk. And so what I'm going to be telling you about is the question about how one can actually annotate protein function, which is, of course, what the annotators at SwissProt are doing all the time every day and providing a tremendous service to the community in doing this. And what I wondered back a decade ago was how accurate these annotations actually are, because today we now have millions of proteins with predicted functions, but only a small number of those, a small fraction of those, have actually been analyzed by any human who actually put any effort into it, and many, many, many fewer have ever been experimentally characterized. And so when we look at all of these functions, which are so critical for biological understanding, how much should we trust them? How much should we use them? And what should we do with them? And so I did a test. I looked at different annotations of the mycoplasma genitalium genome and compared them to see where they agreed and where they disagreed. I'm not going to show you everything that I saw from this. I'm just going to show you a couple examples. There are several cases where actually all three groups would disagree upon what the function of the genes were. In terms of there are other cases where maybe one group would agree and one other group wouldn't, and one group couldn't know what to say. But perhaps even the most worrying cases were those where they were consistent in what they were saying, but there were subtly different things going on. Where in this case of this last gene I'm showing here, MG225, two groups made predictions for what this gene did. A group at NCBI led by Eugene Koonin said this is an amino acid permease, whereas in a group that was led by Chris Sander had done an automated analysis using a method called gene quiz and said this is a histidine permease. Now, what's interesting is it turns out that both groups had done exactly the same process, essentially, to come up with these annotations. They both started with this sequence, MG225, done a search of the databases that existed then, and it was actually the, the very similar databases, and they both found the same highest blast hit when they did their analysis. And that top hit was a histidine permease. And so it turns out the gene quiz just simply said, well, that's the highest hit, and it looks like that's what it is, and so we'll put down histidine permease. Eugene Kuhn know, knew, however, that permeases change their functional specificity rapidly over evolutionary time. And therefore, based on the differences in, in sequence between the histidine permease, which was the best hit, 
and the sequence MG225, they made the prediction this might not actually still be the histidine permease. It may be transporting some other sort of amino acid. And therefore, I'm going to give it this more generic term that's going to be an amino acid permease, not, a, not necessarily histidine permease. So they're consistent. If it is a histidine permease, they're both right. But if it's some other type of permease, then Eugene Quinn will be right, and the Gene Quist method will be wrong. And it still remains to be seen, actually, whether, in fact, the Gene Quist method was correct or not in this case. But it highlighted a very serious problem of not just simply how do we go and find what is the top hit and blast, but how do we actually use that information to figure out what the function is and avoid over-annotation. And so what I'm showing you here is a picture of the entire genome of mycoplasma genitalium. Where each three dots that are aligned vertically corresponds to one gene. Where the colors are the same, it means the predictions were the same. Where the colors are distinct, it means that there was a disagreement over what the function of the gene was. And if you look at this over the entire genome, it turns out you find that a minimum of 8% of the annotations that be wrong was probably closer to actually about 20% of the annotations due to them using the same types of methods and therefore coming up with the same errors. And so I looked very carefully at where were these errors coming from. Why was it that genome annotation was, in fact, so ridden with flaws? And it turns out that one problem was that people were not using methods very well for sequence comparison at that time. They weren't well understood. That's a problem which I think has been largely addressed and doesn't occur very often today. Um, what Eugene Kunin thought was the biggest problem, even back then for the very second genome to be computationally annotated, was propagation of erroneous data, where people would make erroneous predictions, they'd put those in the databases, and then those erroneous predictions would then pollute a further annotation where the person doing the annotation was entirely correct. The gene in the database and the gene they were annotating had the same function, but the database was wrong, and so they copied over incorrect information. But the final thing was the issue of when you actually got BLAST to give you the right answer, it actually found something that was truly homologous, but there had been a functional change within the evolutionary history of that gene. And this was, as I said, the most profoundly difficult thing to try to address. And so over the last decade, I've been working on trying to help and figure out what to do with this. And so what's actually wrong with BLAST in terms of trying to actually make functional predictions? And I'm going to show you as a cartoon, um, first an example, and then a cartoon, which explains actually what can go wrong when you're doing BLAST searches. So this is an actual BLAST search using a gene from Aspergillus nigillans, and we've shown you what the date results are here. You see the top bit here is adenosine deaminase, and some very simple methods that were used a decade ago, which simply say that's the highest hit, so the function of this is adenosine deaminase. But then if you look down this, you see actually there's a lot of support for the adenosine deaminase function, where the database claims that that is the function. If you look further, you find putative and probable adenosine deaminases as well. It's not clear those are any different from the ones we listed as just adenosine deaminase. But still, there's a lot of support here. You find a number of genes whose function simply is not known, and people admit they don't know what it is. But if you look very carefully, you find that there's one hit in this database that matches, which has a slightly different function, which is adenine deaminase. Now, given the way databases are, you might think this is just a typo, that someone mistyped adenosine deaminase. But in fact, it's not. It actually really is an adenine deaminase. And while adenine and adenosine deaminase do essentially the same chemistry on extremely similar substrates, they have profoundly different roles in the cell. One of them is used as an information transfer enzyme in terms of editing the mRNAs. The other one is used as a metabolic enzyme to scavenge nitrogen. And so these really are, have profoundly different roles in the cell, so you want to make sure you distinguish between these effectively. And it turns out, and the reason why I've chosen this example, is because, in fact, the correct function for this protein is the adenine deaminase. So what happened wrong here, and how might we be able to avoid these types of problems in doing functional predictions in the future? And so here's a cartoon of a phylogenetic tree, which has two genes from worm that are parallel to each other, two genes from yeast, which are parallel to each other, a worm from Bacillus subtilis all the way on the right, and then a gene from the Panacostia which is an unknown function which we want to predict. And the colors and the shapes indicate what the functions that are known already are. And so these two genes here are the red circles, those red circles are one function. The green triangles are another function. When one looks at this tree visually, it becomes very readily apparent what's happened evolutionarily. That there was a duplication which occurred at this node on the tree, where these all have retained this function, these have this other function. This is a functional change at that point on the tree. And so we can map evolutionarily what seems to have occurred. And based on this phylogenetic approach to looking at what the functions are and how they're distributed on the tree, we can then fairly reliably say that the methanococcus genashi gene of unknown function is very likely to be the green triangle function. This approach has been described by several people independently. It's been described most eloquently by Jonathan Eisen, who called it phylogenomics, and that's a term for this type of approach which is stuck. But really just means looking at a phylogenetic tree and using a, a basically intuition on that tree. So that's what you would come up with, that the gene would be that green triangle, and that would probably be right. But now let me show you what BLAST would do. What BLAST is doing is it's looking for the most similar sequence, and similarity corresponds to distance on this evolutionary tree. 
Now, if you look at what's the most similar sequence to the unknown that I've drawn here, it's actually that red yeast function. So BLAST would then make the prediction that was going to be red because the direction distance to the closest green one would be much longer. So BLAST would actually make this really bizarre looking non-parsimonious functional prediction that would be red. Now, in some unusual cases, that might be true, but generally, we wouldn't think that's what would happen, and experience shows that's not what commonly happens. And it turns out that BLAST is systematically flawed. It actually gets worse as we have more data. So here I'm going to show you, for example, now let's imagine that instead of just having one yeast gene, or one gene from one yeast strain that we're looking at, we actually have a large number of yeast proteins we're looking at. Well, now what happens is all of these yeast proteins that are red are all closer than these yeast proteins that are green. And so as you get more and more data, we'll blast make stronger and stronger and stronger predictions that's actually going to be that red function. And so you can see how BLAST is going to make mistakes when just simply looking at the tree phylogenetically would make sense. And so this phylogenomic approach is going a lot of currency as being a more accurate way of doing function prediction. In the case of that BLAST search I showed you before for the adenosine deaminase, let's see how it would work. Well, you do start still with a BLAST search or with a PFAM search to get a family of proteins, but then you throw away all the E values. And instead what you do is you build a phylogenetic tree. And you don't simply build a phylogenetic tree, you also would do what's called reconciliation, comparing that gene tree to the phylogenetic tree of the species from which the genes um, derive. And that lets you learn where gene duplications occur because genes are more likely to change their function after a duplication event, although that's a fairly minor effect, it turns out. And then what we do is we use the assumption that amino acid changes will be generally in parallel function. This is not a strict requirement. Neither the manual approaches nor the automated approaches to this require this, but it's a general trend. And so we basically use the phylogenetic tree as a proxy for how we expect the function to evolve. If we look at the phylogenomics method on the adenosine adding deaminase, as I'm showing you here, it turns out that the protein that we want to annotate is up here. We look at this and we realize this clade here is going to be an adenine deaminase clade, and that this group down here would be adenosine deaminase. We'd infer where the functional change occurred, and then we make the correct functional prediction using that phylogenetic tree for the adenosine and adenine deaminases, where we got the wrong result from that flash search I showed you previously. So phylogenomics has been very popular for doing highly accurate and robust functional predictions. Jonathan Eisen has spent a lot of time doing this. When I say a lot of time, I mean it seriously. He basically spent the last three years of his PhD annotating four protein families. So it's not something that can readily be scaled because of the amount of work that it takes to do it and the expert knowledge that goes into it. And furthermore, like most uh, manual methods, that when you finally get the results, you don't really know how to interpret them. If Jonathan Eisen has done an annotation of um, DNA repair enzymes, I know I should really trust these and look at these carefully because I also know there's a 50-page paper that backs all this up. But if you see some other phylogenetic approach done by someone on a larger scale, you really don't know what to make of it, whether this is something that the person really trusts or whether it's simply a one-off thing that they did. And so we've worked on how to begin to automate this phylogenomic approach. And so the first thing we've done is, if, like most groups that work in trying to do automated function prediction, we have used the Go ontology. Um, but this is, the method we have is not limited to Go ontology. We'll show you, though, we've used that as a starting point. But a key thing we do is we don't just simply use information about what the functions indicate are. We also use information about what the evidence for that function is. So if something is shown to be experimentally known, or if there's been manual curation of it, then we consider it to be quite reliable and fairly confident in that function description. On the other hand, if it's purely by an electronic annotation, then we give very, very little weight to that functional description that's given for that gene. And what we're able to do then is have a model of function evolution that actually integrates all information. And so I won't explain the equation, but let's take over just a kind of notion of how the model works which is that basically we allow every function in any ancestral protein to change to any function in any daughter protein. And we learn how likely it is for any function to change to any other function by actually looking at how often the annotated functions have changed on that tree. So we may learn, for example, the change from adenosine to adenine deaminase is very rare, whereas the change between lactate and malate dehydrogenase is something that happens relatively commonly. And that lactate dehydrogenase with NADP um, as a cofactor will change more commonly to uh, malate dehydrogenase with NADP as a cofactor. So we learn what all these parameters are in this molecular function evolution model. And we infer this over the whole tree. And this is actually the example of what happened when we automatically analyzed the adenosine deaminase family using our method, which we've called SIFR. And I'll explain at the end why we actually call it SIFR. And so what you see here is the entire phylogenetic tree, which uh, actually is a portion of the phylogenetic tree that I'm showing you here. The whole tree has a couple hundred proteins, wouldn't fit on the slide. If you look in the Go annotation database, you find that there are five proteins that have been experimentally characterized and described in the Go annotation database as having been experimentally characterized. And we use solely those as evidence for testing the method on this family. And we ran the method and made 
predictions, and those predictions are shown here where green is the adenosine deaminase, blue is the adenine deaminase, red is the AMP deaminase. And you see here is it basically follows what you would have done intuitively. And it basically marks out this big clade over here as being adenosine deaminase, this clade over here as being adenine deaminase, this clade over here as being AMP deaminase, and actually first the root is going to be adenosine deaminase because of these nodes over here that are near the root that are also thin deaminase that makes these predictions. So now we have a whole lot of predictions for this family. What can we do with them? Well, it turns out that if you spend a month in the library, as my graduate student did, you will find that there are about another 30 proteins that have been experimentally characterized there in this family, but are not described in any database as having been experimentally characterized. So these actually formed a gold standard test set to see whether our predictions were actually correct. And it turns out that with one exception, they were. The one mistake we made was this protein over here, and what you can see with that protein is, in fact, um, that the lightness of the gray there indicates it was a very weak prediction. It was not one we had a lot of confidence in. And what happened was basically Sifter incorrectly inferred where the shift from adenosine to adenine deaminase occurred within this tree. It basically got the, the clade boundary incorrect. So it's a subtle problem, which I think actually if we were to manually study it, we would make it as well. In fact, it turns out Sifter works better than my graduate student who did all this literature research. When she manually looked at this tree and tried to figure out what the functions be, she got three wrong. And so Sifter did better, only got one wrong. We want to take this actually a step further as well, and this is what my group has begun to do in a larger scale. We actually took one of these proteins, which had been purified by the SGPP Structural Genomic Center led by Wim Hole in Seattle, and they actually gave us the protein, um, whose structure has now actually been solved by another structural genomic, the Structural Genomic Center in Canada. And we actually experimentally characterized this and determined that, in fact, it did have the adenosine deaminase function, which we had predicted. And so when we look at the comparison of all these different methods that are out there, or not all of them, there's a handful of methods that are out there for doing protein function prediction, we find that on this family, Sifter made the smallest number of omitted or erroneous function predictions. Got one wrong out of those roughly 20, 25 or 30, which gave us a 4% error rate, and did much, much better than BLAST or gene quiz. The BLAST, in this case, we simply took the top BLAST hit, or the top annotated BLAST hit, you would get somewhere in the order of 20 to 30% wrong. Now, there is one other method which I want to comment on, which is the very last one, which is orthostrapper, which on this um, graph looks like it did very badly, that it uh, made correct annotations for a very small fraction of the proteins. But what actually is happening is that it's simply failing to annotate most proteins. And because that, the reason it's doing this is it also uses a phylogenomic model. It's using the same basic principles we've used in Sifter, but it's using these in a deterministic way, whereas in Sifter we're applying these in a probabilistic way. And so orthostrapper, when it didn't know what to do, it simply just made no prediction at all. The result is it made only a couple of predictions, but got every one of them right. And so that's another, uh, I think, vote in favor of the phylogenomic approach, and I think that shows us there are things we still have to learn from other methods that exist out there. And so finally, where does the method SIFT, and where does the name SIFTER come from? Well, all of you are familiar with BLAST as being a very powerful tool for doing mining, and people do blasting around, blasting up mountainsides all the time. Um, and following on the heels of BLAST came Sean Eddy's hammer method. And Sean had described hammer as a more precise tool for doing molecular data mining than as a BLAST. But what I'd argue, if you want to do molecular archaeology, what you really want to be using is not even a hammer, but rather a sifter. And sifter stands for statistical inference of function through evolutionary relationships. And so it's a method that we currently have continuing to develop underway. And I want to close by actually just giving outlooks on a, on a different direction, which I think is, this must be what gives Amos and the Swiss Brock crew nightmares, if not worse, which is the Global Ocean Survey. This was Craig Venter's jaunt around the world on his cruise, on, it, on his um, yacht, which is over here. Here you can see the route map that he took going around here. And we were able to analyze the data from the first set of this in collaboration with the Venter Institute, which is 17 million new peptide sequences. Now this number, this data, is a real challenge for databases like SwissPro, and I think for the whole um, biological community to use for several reasons. One is that it's vast. It basically triples the amount of protein sequence data that's available from this one simple cruise, and actually it's going halfway around the world, so the rest of the world will probably double it again. The second thing that makes it very challenging is that it's fragmentary, that these are typically not whole proteins because they don't get very much assembly when they look at these. Typically a given assembly has one and a half proteins on it, so you get one whole protein and then half of another protein, which is a real challenge to work with. I think that as these metagenomic, environmental genomic data coming from sequencing the oceans, sequencing um, all sorts of environmental sites become more prevalent, we're going to have to figure out how to better make use of all these data. I'm not going to tell you about all the results we found there. I just want to highlight one of them, which was fairly interesting. Looking at a set of proteins called IDO, endolamine dioxygenase, 
to set up proteins that are involved in tryptophan biosynthesis and degradation, um, which have been particularly interesting because they're involved in the mammalian immune system. And what we discovered was that these are found not just in eukaryotes, which is the only place they've ever been seen before, but in fact they're found profoundly diverse in bacteria as well. And so why are these immune system proteins that involve tryptophan degradation in bacteria? We don't know. They're heme binding proteins, and so our suspicion is they may actually have an entirely different function that's involved in oxygen storage, but we really don't have any ideas. So I think these are the type of interesting questions where we need to get in these type of environmental data. Let me conclude by just mentioning a very new project that my lab has gone into, which is continuing this idea of metagenomics and trying to do environmental sampling, which involves looking at the fact that we are outnumbered. That our cells are 10 to the 13, we carry with us about 10 to the 14 microbial cells. So when we each walk in this room, we're 10 to 1 bacteria to humans. And it's worse than that. We heard from Janet this morning, Janet Thornton this morning, that as more complex organisms with more genes tend to also have a more diverse array of metabolic functions. But in fact, our genes are outnumbered perhaps 100 to 1 in terms of the metabolic functions by the microbi by microbes that we carry with us, which are essential to our immune development, to our digestion, and to many other biological processes in human, normal human health. And so most of our genes are, in fact, not actually our own. And so we've begun to actually begin to look at these. And to do this, we're not using a vehicle like this one, unfortunately. We have this much more unlovely vehicle, which is this one, for collecting a sample. And we have a root map as well, which looks roughly like this, to try to collect them. And we've been focusing especially on individuals with Crohn's disease, which is a disease which is known to be associated with gut microbes. And it's been known for about 50 years to be associated with gut microbes in a way that's really not been well characterized. And so we're working with two gastroenterologists at Mount Sinai to actually collect samples from individuals with Crohn's disease and see how they differ from samples from individual patients and also how inflamed portions of the gut differ from uninflamed portions of the gut to really understand what's happening. And what we're particularly interested to look at is also what happens when you have community upset or disorder. So if any of you go out and get some bad food and get really sick, um, I've got the test for you to find out what's actually happening. And furthermore, as an incentive, then we want to also find out what happens when you give patients antibiotics. It turns out that you know, when you take an antibiotic, does that mean you wipe out almost all of the cells you're carrying around with you and that you're down to only 10 or 13 cells? Or does it mean you're only simply tweaking this, the composition of that community? It turns out that the gastroenterological community simply does not know when we take an um, antibiotic what it's actually really doing. Furthermore, there's recently been a huge amount of very nicely done research that's phenomenological about probiotics improving health, improving productivity, but no one knows what the probiotics are actually, probiotics are actually really doing. And so we hope to actually be able to explore that as well. And so finally, I promised I would conclude with some very new experiments. And so these are the two key people who worked on the SIFTER project. Barbara Engelhardt was a graduate student in computer science who intrepidly um, drifted into biology and did most of this work under the joint supervision of Michael Jordan in the computer science department. The new biological experiments they've been doing is Barbara had a baby two weeks ago, and Mike had a baby one week ago, and there they are. Um, and our work on metagenomics has been in collaboration with the, with the Craig Ventures Institute and a number of people in my research group. So thank you very much for your attention. Do we have any questions? Hi. Um, in some families, um, sometimes a single mutation leads to a change in the function. So how do you account for that, or how would you account for that, where most probably some errors might creep in in the phylogenomics approach? Uh, is that yeah, so that, that's a very good point, that not every family has its functions um, parsimoniously distributed over the evolutionary tree. And if you had one mutation that something that's very labile like that, then first of all, it's not going to be well suited to the phylogenomics approach. And there are some families like that. One family we looked at um, turns out to be very much like that, and you can't use it very well. But one thing that we've actually begun to now do with, with SIFTER is SIFTER can take any type of evidence you have. And so if you knew, for example, that there was a binding site that was critical for being able to recognize a particular substrate as compared with another substrate, you could actually use the output of any other method as input to this method, and then use SIFTER as a way of phylogenetically integrating the results over the entire family. So instead of just simply taking your one data point of that particular protein, where you're going to have some, a lot of noise associated with that, you can see why there may be the clade of other proteins, which also have not been experimentally characterized, also have that same sort of feature. And so I think that's actually probably what the main future of Citrus going to be, is not getting data from Go where they're experimental annotations, but actually using it as, as a meta predictor, as, where you actually have a very evolutionarily principled way of integrating these types of data. 
Um, and finally, what I think is going to happen is, I mean, I, we don't view Sifter as being primarily a way of making predictions which will be the end point. We view Sifter as a way of doing all the integration as a kind of clue for then a human annotator who can then look at this, and if they also know the uh, type of information, they would know to be suspicious. But also, a key thing is that if you have a very labile function like that, that then those parameters that we have that actually learn how likely it is to change from one function to another function will reflect that. You'll know that you actually never have any great confidence about what a function prediction is um, because it's so labile um, relative to mutation. Um, this may be a stupid question, but I'm a novice, just so I can ask good questions. Um, when we analyzed these uh, nucleolar proteins and we got a cross species, um, we found that sometimes uh, we got the impression, and maybe this is common knowledge to everybody here, but it was not to me, that if somebody studies an ortholog in, let's say, Drosophila and says this is the function, then the whole Drosophila community runs with that and it's confirmed and confirmed, then the, the same protein is uh, studied in humans and another function is assigned and they divert further and further. But in fact, it's a multifunctional protein. So have you ever checked your contro controversies between groups, whether they were both right rather than... Uh, one of them is always wrong. So in the cases of the functions that we were characterizing, we were looking at things that were very simple, where it's, where it's an enzymatic assay. Um, we actually have avoided doing the, these more subtle cases. Um, because probably, Are you referring back to the, uh, to the very beginning we're talking about the, uh, the, the mycoplasma? So for the mycoplasma, there were certainly some cases where it looked like two groups each gave half of a multifunctional role. And what I basically inferred was that they were each half wrong, and basically they, they, they would account for that. And so I think there's certainly cases like that exist in the analysis I did um, on the mycoplasma. And, and I think that that is a challenge, is how to deal with these types of things, where different communities think different things. In fact, they're each seeing a different part of the elephant, one seeing the trunk and one seeing the tail and one seeing the legs. The last question behind you. Thank you. I have a question about the gene trees. Um, so the, the, the method really heavily depends on the quality of the gene trees. And so we've seen, for instance, a tree that is very large. Uh, and we also heard that uh, it, it depends on the multiple sequence alignment, which uh, also adds a layer of uncertainty. Um, well, on the other hand, your results are, are very convincing. So I, I, how, what is your assessment about the gene trees, uh, large scale gene trees uh, at, at the moment? So that was a very, very important point, that our method depends upon the trees basically as a foundation. We, and right now we're simply taking a single tree as given and use that exclusively. And I was terrified about that because all trees are wrong. And they're going to be especially wrong near the root. And, they'll, and so they're going to have lots of problems. So the question is, are we going to make mistakes that are egregious based on those trees? And so I had a battle with my graduate student about this. He finally agreed to do some bootstrap. And we looked at different trees and looked to see how robust the method was to different trees. It turns out that actually the worst tree building programs give us the best results in Sifter. And so the quality of the tree doesn't seem to be a big issue. For a while I wondered why this might be. And it turns out that actually this is true as well for building progressive multiple alignments. That Bob Edgar has seen the same thing in trying to build progressive multiple alignments. That actually if you make a neighbor joining tree or even a UPGMA tree, that often works better than a really good tree for, for building multiple alignments. And the reason for this, I think, is that the trees tend to get things near the leaves right most of the time. And they get things near the root wrong most of the time. But in the case of sifter, the distance from the leaf up to the root and back is so far that has very little information in terms of the function prediction. And therefore, if your root's all wrong, it basically doesn't make much difference. It could just be a cloud, and it's not going to change your predictions very much. It'll, it'll tweak them a little bit. Certainly, if we had better trees, we might get slightly better predictions. But it turns out they were not exquisitely dependent upon the tree in the way it initially feared. Um, but one extension we want to have to the sifter method is where it actually will go and basically do the Bayesian analysis not just over the different functions, but do a Bayesian analysis over a Bayesian selection of trees. We actually weight each tree according to the probability and then take that into account accordingly. Um, but we're not actually sure if that's going to make a difference, whether it's going to be worth the time cost that it, that it entails. Because right now, building the tree is by far the most time-consuming step of running the sifter on a gene family. Thank you very much. <laughs>